and welcome to the latest Wind in the Willows review. Uh, we're getting there, we're getting towards the end and um, uh, we're heavily into winter now. Christmas and New Year have gone now and um, it's time for fancy dress. Um, so I chose this episode for this week because it's um, still kind of got that festive feel and that party feel and I felt that it's best to go with that one before we get into the um, the episodes with the heavy snow because we still haven't got snow yet, certainly not where we are. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, Fancy Dress from Series 2. Um, this is, I think for me, it's become a classic. Um, I didn't have it from early childhood on video, uh, but I eventually got it and um, I love it. It's, it's, it's a real, yeah, brilliant one, this one. So let's get stuck into it. I'm gonna press play right now. Okay, so. Fancy Dress uh, is from Series 2, it's the last one of Series 2, um, directed by Jackie Cockle. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting to know how many of you um, had the Masquerade VHS tape. Um, it, was, it was one I wasn't aware of uh, for quite a few years until I came across it um, in a second-hand video shop. Um, I can't remember where we were, uh, but I remember that my nan was with us, uh, I mean, I was we were out somewhere with my parents. Um, it was a shop open quite uh, late into the evening, from what I remember, and it means something to me that my nan was there because she is the one I think I've said before that introduced the Wind and the Willows to me uh, with the, the film, and um, and I was just so excited. I thought, wow, this is a video I didn't know existed, um, and the ep episodes on it, of course, were um, a producer's lot, Winter Horse and fancy dress and um there's a lot of mention of the parts of Penzance because of course the producer's lot um is all about performance of that and there's a nod to the parts of Penzance in the episode episode as well um i love the way it opens as you can see um just like last week's episode we open with kind of wintry snowy scenes um but a lot of this episode takes place indoors and most of it does um, and it's a very nice cosy opening in Badgers. Um, it's an unusual episode, this one, in that it has two songs in it. Um, of course, one of them, only one of them was written for the actual show, and the other one is actually from the Pirates of Pendants by Kilburn Sullivan. Um, which means something to me as well, of course, because I, I was in the Pirates of Pendants, um three years ago. Uh, play the sergeant of police, uh, which is the role taken on by the chief weasel in this. <laughs> um, so we have quite a few episodes like this, um, where we start with Ratty, Mole and Badger talking about something that Toad's up to, and in this case we of course have Otter with them. They welcome presents from Otter. And I, I think that's the first time we see Otter in his new sculpt. I've mentioned before in last week's episode, he's, the new otter, but the old otter is also in series two, if you think of episodes uh, like The Storm. Um, and then of course he pops up right in the last episode in, in his new sculpt. <laughs> now this this song is great, you know, it's a lovely sort of... I mean the visuals are basically a montage and Ratty Mole singing about what who they could dress as, they could become so many characters. And of course, the costume makers had a blast with this episode. They had so many opportunities for different costumes. And the final costumes that Ratty and Mole and Badger go for are just absolutely fantastic. All of them still exist today. They're in the archive and they're just a wonder to behold. Um, of course, we'll talk about them when we get to them. Um, and this song actually has um, a very Gilbert and Sullivan feel. Um, if you're familiar with Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, they of course wrote the Pirates of Penzance, and it's very fitting that that this song with this kind of, kind of musical feel um, is in this episode. And uh, my dad actually said that it's very musical. My dad and um, we wondered for years was it actually written by Gilbert and Sullivan, but of course no, it wasn't. It was written by um, Keith Hopwood and Malcolm Rowe, of course, and is available on that wonderful Songs and Music CD. And it's one of the uh, one of only two times we hear Badger sing. <laughs> uh, the other which, the other song, of course, is um, You've Got to Have a Little Style from Mole's Cousin. Um, I think it's fair to say Michael Holden isn't really a singer, but it's Badger. It's fine, there we go, we see Badger's costume. Now. 
Now, that's Bacha mentioning the Raja of Jabalpur, who we met in India. Um, he's been brought up in other episodes. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think now, well, Visits in India, of course, it was brought up in New Time Entertainment. Uh, later in Series 5, it's brought up in um, Toad. Is it Toad Filmmaker? No, it's um, Mr. Toad of the Times. He's tracked so many of them. <laughs> and the Chief's Return, it's, he's mentioned in as well, just remember. Uh, now, they're talking about Toad now, um, going as a night watchman. And we find out why that's funny later on, of course. Um, so, I like the way otters whispering here as if the weasels are listening, and they are in the wildwood after all. You never know. I always wonder, like. No, I mean, Badger obviously does feel safe, but any weasel could find their way into Badger somehow, just by making their way through Badger tunnels and um, I love that shot there, the snow, it's just a reminder that there is snow all around them. Um, and this is one of the funniest scenes just ever. <laughs> this weasel makes me laugh. So he, he desperately wants to go as a fairy, so you wonder if he's a bit, I don't know, a bit the other way, maybe. <laughs> um, and you almost wonder, you know, some kids might wonder, well, why does he want to go as a fairy? Fairies are girls' things, you know. <laughs> but it just makes you laugh, you know. The fact that it's not explained, it doesn't need to be explained. But there's a lot of humour underneath it all that, um, that is very, actually very intelligent. Um, and it gets funnier later on, actually, when he does end up going as a fairy after all. Even though the chief's saying they're all going as burglars. Um, so somehow that weasel gets his own way. <laughs> what I love about scenes like this as well is when the weasel's... They make, you know, it's obvious how stupid they are. And the henchman is just as stupid, even though he tries to pretend, tries to make out that he's more intelligent than they are. He's higher up on the food chain than they are. The policeman! Where? Look out! The bobbies! <laughs> Will you shut up, you great twilly? But you said there was... It's just so funny, the way the chief says, a policeman, and you, you could almost want to, like, join the henchman on what his way of thinking. <laughs> and we got the classic... There's a few, few episodes where the henchman says why like that after thinking for a bit. Beautifully timed and beautifully delivered. I mean, Brian Truman wasn't only a fantastic writer, he was a superb voice artist and he knew comic timing. And he told me when I met him uh, the first time that he, um, he got all that from his years doing radio plays. And, yeah, I'd love to look all those up and find... I don't know if anyone watching knows uh, of any links to any Brian Truman to a lot of it would be lost on, I would have thought. Um, now, like I say, absolute um, feast, the well, challenge the costume makers had and the prop makers all the food uh, for this episode. But even the youngsters, like all these little costumes. And again, a lot of these exist as well. Uh, they were saved because they are just little marvels. Uh, little one-offs that would never be worn again in any other episode. You know? Um, we're about to see Ratty and Mole. There we go. Now, you don't appreciate the detail until these close ups. Look at all those beads on Mole. I mean, it just blows my mind every time I see it. And when, when I looked at the costume and studied it, oh, I don't quite know how it was done. I mean, it's just absolutely, absolute skill and a lot of time, time spent on it. Otter's costumes do exist as well. Oh, look at badges, isn't that beautiful? You um, certainly <laughs> look the part, Badger. Mm. It just suits him so perfectly. And Otter wearing a fishmonger's costume is very yes, um, inspired. Fish, and I love Ratty's Admiral costume. I mean, all of it, it's just beautiful. Yes. Ah. Otter just eats complete fish in one go. Uh, 
So we've already got, we already know what the breeze is up to. Um, so, I mean, she, she didn't really explain it in that last scene, but we're seeing, we just saw a weasel take something from Rackley. Um, and they're going to carry on. The music, incidentally, incidentally, <laughs> is incidental music. Um, wonderful track called Steamboat Ray, which is available on that CD. If you just listen to that track alone, it's a wonderful, like, ragtime piece. Um, and meant for party scenes like this, and this is the one I always remember it most from. Um, I like this piece, I love this piece, but this is unavailable, so, um, so there he is, there's the weasel, we managed to somehow um, get away with it, he either talked the chief round or went behind his back and showed up like it and then there was, wasn't enough time to change, but I love that there's some backstory there that isn't explained and viewers can kind of work it out for themselves, <laughs> and those pers pers perceptive audience members will know that that was Toad just then, that sound coming from the suit of armor. <laughs> the fact that he's a fairy and still behaving as a burglar. Um, if I was the, I was the chief, I'd just tell him to just stay out of it. <laughs> oh, it's just funny. I think it's just a bit of an in-joke in with the makers at Costco Hall when they did this. This is one of the episodes, actually, where Paul Berry and Sue Pugh, who of course were the team on this, um, did a lot of overtime, and there was quite, quite a bit of controversy over it, from speaking to various people who worked there. Um, you had the two crews. One crew um, would be with Chris Taylor, later with Francis Foes, and they would get it done on time, they'd be on schedule, even ahead of schedule at times, and they'd always deliver. Paul and Sue, on the other hand, would be behind schedule uh, because they take more time and care with the work. But then they'd be able to do it overtime, paid overtime, to get it done, which they were happy to do. So they got paid more, got better results, and got a lot of praise for it. So I can see where there's controversy there. Um, but, I mean, the results speak for themselves. I mean, all episodes are wonderful, but this is one where you can see why it took a lot of time uh, with the... Uh, <clears throat> the scene that's coming on scene, up soon. Look at that animation of Toad's arm. Beautifully done. Just that vibration of progressing. I always talk to my students about progression. Member students, if you're watching. If you haven't sussed it yet, progression is the key. So you're progressing with each action uh, in, the, in the direction you want to go. And when it's a vibration, you've got to keep going further up every time you go down. And so on. Um, His eye animation here, his eye leaves, and then the head follows. Details like that. And Paul and Sue are, of course, uh, just as good as each other, really. Fantastic. Crowd scenes like that, as I know, take a long time. It's very fitting, actually, this one's the last one in the series, too. It's like a grand finale, isn't it? Except we don't see much of Toad, of course, we hear a fair bit. <laughs> But that is Toad in there. With my, uh, uh, now this is why um, it's, it's so strange for me personally that I was in um, four Gilbert and Sullivan operettas over the last four years. The first was the Pirates Penzance and Louise was about to perform um, a song from that that I sang. But at the same time we got Toad in the background uh, as a knight in armour and I played, of all things, I was, I was a knight in armour hiding in the suit of armour in the following show, which was Ruddigore. Who would have thought? <laughs> so this is the scene that apparently was done with a lot of overtime, and you can see why. So you've got all this choreography. Now look at the detail of the, the, the fairy. <laughs> now that, again, I'm putting all my little story together here that isn't seen, of course, but it seems that all the weasels, except the one dressed as a fairy, rehearsed this, which makes sense. He, he wasn't part of it. <laughs> So he's always making up his own movements, he's always slightly behind, he's trying to follow what detail that is. And that would be lost with a lot of kids, I think. Um, so he's in line now, which is goes kind of against it, but... Um, <laughs> and I love the weasel be able to play the glasses on. <laughs> Hear 
So, and doing songs, it does take a lot of planning and working out. <laughs> um, you know, you've got to work out all, well, you always do directions to break it down dialogue, but with songs, you're going to get all the beats and the rhythm and, and, and it's got to be totally in time. That swing was beautiful, that would have been on single frames, otherwise it would have slowed because it's, a, it's that kind of action, a smooth, consistent action. Um, same with these. Look at the fairy again. Late on each time. Wonderful. Reminds me of me old bamboo from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Dick Van Dyke, being slightly behind everyone else. Um, <laughs> I love this little line here. So of course the chief had a, a pretty good player really, uh, caused this distraction and to provide some entertainment while they try and get the uh, suit of armour out of the toad hall to the back doors he says. Now when he says back door I guess I don't quite understand where he means but you'd have to go down the stairs surely to get to the back door. One day I've got to work out a complete plan of toad hall. Uh, based on these episodes, where all these doors are and what they lead to. And... So Toad makes a grand appearance. <laughs> this bit's done quite nicely, spitting out that necklace. <laughs> now, the only thing with this episode is the ending for me is a bit far fetched. I mean, it's all far-fetched, really, I know, but the ending, I think, first of all, they're saying arrest them. Now, there's there've been many times when the Weezers have stolen things and got away with things, and very rarely is it suggested they should be arrested. I mean, I guess Badger does occasionally threaten them with jail, uh, but to shout out arrest them like that is only done, really, to make the story then make sense. Uh, but then the Chief is convincing them that he's a real policeman which is a bit you, you know I don't love that you know, that sort of humor <laughs> but we understand how to to can be for but the others I don't really buy it so the ending doesn't quite come together for me but and it's Toad that of course saves the day he's, he's actually reversed isn't it Toad's, Toad's the one that knows this time <laughs> And you got Ratty and Badger sort of realising, what, it's the Chief Weasel, how could they not realise it's him, you know, so... I don't know, but anyway. Lots of action here. Um, got youngsters chasing Weasels. <laughs> Look, I love this, where the one dress is a fairy lifts up the hat. <laughs> There's a lovely sense of weight when Toad came up then. That was lovely, beautifully done. Yes, he's all right. <laughs> I still don't quite follow what happened. I was in the armour. And now, of course, we get what you meant by a knight in armour. That's stuck in there with you. <laughs> well, I didn't put it in it. They did. Every time they pinch something, they... Yeah, you appreciate Mole's costume more and more, didn't you? He's close up. <laughs> so, it's nice to actually have a bit of Toad in this final scene. Um, Night Watchman. So it all totally makes sense. And I, I like that, um, you know, um, it's, it's all very realistically done, you know, normally Toad would be the centre of attention, and he was at the end, you know, but the way he's just a bit downhearted about it all, you know, the party's pretty much over, um, he wasn't able to move, he wasn't able to enjoy the party, and um, he maintains, the animators maintain that kind of solemn expression with him. Um, so that's experienced animators for you, know, good direction. Yeah. And I, I do like that joke, you, you spent the night in armour instead, I mean that is clever. <laughs> so yeah, very good, very witty script, um, nice to have the songs in there, and um, a very fitting end to the series too, you've got this kind of grand finale with um, a lovely big party at the end of what was really a, 
a much bigger series than series one. It's often been described that it was just, it had such a more of an expanded canvas. Um, it felt like it could breathe more, it went outside more, even though this one was in, but you know, um, it grew more and the, the stories are more ambitious and interesting. And, uh, and series three, of course, grew even more. Um, and that opened with uh, Paper Jace, of course, great one to open with. Um, so there we go. So yeah, so I do remember seeing that for the first time on that Mask Wave video. I mean, I can't remember when that was. I mean, it must have been, gosh, when I was in my very early teens, I think, when I came across that video. So it was a fair while on. And then, of course, came up on Channel 5. And then it was released on one of the Time Life DVDs and so on. Um, so yeah, let me know your thoughts on that one. Um, uh, I'm guessing that's probably probably a particular favourite of a lot of people, just because of the spectacle of it. Um, and uh, it's a clever idea. Um, and it's pretty, it's funny. Uh, lots of humour of the weasels, um, and yeah, just a lovely, cosy episode for this for this time of year. Um, and the way Toad Hall was decorated, you know, it still reminded me a little bit of the Christmassy period, even though we just left that. It just felt right to put that there. Um, and uh, and we now, of course, well, next week, get into the, the snowy episode. So whether we'll have snow, I don't know. I'm kind of hoping it does to sync up with it. It does snow, but if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, we're actually going to start with winter haunts. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, oh, we want winter sports and the rescue. They're coming. Uh, but I thought I'd do winter haunts first, just because that's another one that takes place indoors. Uh, and it just feels right to just do those ones then and then we'll expand and go outdoors into those uh, Series 2 winter episodes. Uh, winter Sports, of course, is from Series 3. And funny enough, it was on that, I said before, on that Mask Grey video preceding the one we just watched. Um, so it's the other way around, but uh, never mind. Um, so yeah, Winter Hawks from Series 3, that'll be next week. So do join me for that and uh, wrap up warm because it does seem to be getting colder. So. Again, why well, I think snow might be on the way pretty soon, uh, but we'll see. So till next Sunday then, all the best and uh, keep the comments coming and I will get back to them now, I promise, I will. And that takes me a while sometimes, but I will. <laughs> Thanks for watching everyone and uh, see you soon.